Hello everyone and welcome to Webinar Wednesdays. This is a second of a Deep Carbon Observatory series designed to bring modeling and visualization tools to you to help you better store, manage, and share your data. And my name is Darlene Truchrist, and I'm in the unique position of working with both the engagement team and the synthesis group 2019, both of which are charged with bringing the DCO's scientific results and sharing them more broadly. So it is my extreme pleasure today to introduce you to our presenters. The first is Shauna Morrison. She's on the left, and she's a postdoctoral researcher at Carnegie Institution for Science at the Geophysical Laboratory in Washington, D.C. And she's a mineralogist and a crystallographer, and she has an amazing vision for minerals on the planet. Wait till you see. And to her right is Ahmed Alish, and he's a visiting researcher at Carnegie um, right now. And he's also a PhD candidate at Rensselaer Polytech Institute, where he's a specialist in data science. And Ahmed is going to demonstrate his remarkable ability to apply these data science skills to network analysis or science data. It's really, it's fascinating. I'm really excited about this one. But before we start, a bit of housekeeping. Um, the presenters will present for 25 minutes approximately, and then there will be 15 minutes for questions and answers. So should you have a question along the way, just simply type it into the chat window on your screen, and uh, Shauna and Ahmed will do their best to answer any and all questions. So with that, I'm pleased to turn it over to our experts. Shauna? Thank you, Darlene, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to have the opportunity to uh, tell you about networks and network analysis, which is an approach to analyzing and visualizing multidimensional data. Uh, so for today's webinar, we're going to focus on networks relating to the diversity and distribution of minerals on Earth's surface, because that's my area of expertise. And so we have lists of mineral occurrences all over the globe, uh, data on the properties of these minerals, and information on their geographic and geologic settings. While we're talking about mineral networks today, uh, we're not restricted to these types of data. In fact, uh, we're surrounded by and even made up of natural and artificial networks. Uh, they're the relationships between us and our peers, the map of electrical impulses in our nervous system, and the destinations on our vacation itineraries. As far back as 1735 with the Konigsberg Bridge problem, Mathematicians have employed quantitative methods to characterize networks, to solve network problems, and even to create new networks. Uh, nowadays, network science is a field that draws from mathematics, computer science, and other scientific domains in order to provide a set of quantitative tools and methods for researchers to discover and solve problems using data. Now let us look at some real world examples of networks. One of the most familiar applications is studying social interactions or the relationships between people, such as social media, like the network of Twitter users you see here, each of whom tweeted a certain key word, like DCO webinar. Uh, it could also be a collaboration network, like that of the Keck Foundation Deep Time Data Infrastructure Initiative. Uh, I'd like to note that all the mineral networks we're going to show you later on came from this initiative. We could also characterize the spread of an epidemic like SARS shown here, by examining the relationships between infected individuals and the hospitals and or airports they travel through. The knowledge gained from analyzing these systems can help you address many questions, such as to whom should I target my product advertisement, or which group of collaborators is best equipped to help with my research problems, or importantly, what precautions can the CDC or the World Health Organization take to limit the spread of epidemics in the future. We can also look at artificially constructed networks, that is, networks that researchers and engineers deliberately create with a specific purpose in mind. A simple example could be the computer network in your office or university. You know, more complex examples include transportation and telecommunications networks, things like train systems. These are not haphazardly constructed. Network theory is used to optimize metrics such as throughput, coverage, utilization, and efficiency in order to maximize the usefulness of the system while minimizing cost. Another important example is the power grid. Without a well-functioning system of generating and transporting electricity, our society cannot function. Anticipating the needs of the users in the network, all the way from small single-family homes 
to large industrial factories is critical to determining the amount of energy each power plant must produce. An additional complication is that these calculations need to be done for varying timescales, from daily to monthly to yearly and even tens of years. Now, besides networks in the physical world, networks are also the basis for the cyber world. For example, all the sites you visit on the web are part of a large, ever-growing network. Here we can see the hyperlinks between, the number, between a number of informational websites, including Wikipedia and news outlets. Wikipedia is a repository for knowledge and information, and as you would expect, uh, it's right in the middle of the network. It sounds intuitive and could be guessed by looking at the data, but it's much more visually affirming in the network. Uh, additionally, networks are a great way of organizing human knowledge and teaching about new concepts and how they relate to each other. For example, mind maps, like many of us are familiar with, and you can see here. Um, so essentially, networks don't just apply to the physical world, but also to concepts, thoughts, and ideas, which illustrate the flexible nature of network theory. So now we've given you a few well-established examples of networks and their powerful uses. Let us take a step back a bit and describe the actual components that networks are made of. A network, which is equivalent to a graph from graph theory in discrete mathematics, consists of a set of vertices or nodes and a set of edges or links. Each of the edges in a network, or each of the vertices, actually has a unique label, and so do each of the edges. As you can see in the first figure here, these two nodes labeled V1 and V2 are connected by edge E1, which represents a relationship between these two nodes. Now, beyond the basic structure of the network, there are a number of ways in which the network can be modified to illustrate important features of the data. For example, nodes can be shaped, sized, or colored to represent attributes in the data. As you can see, these notes, two nodes here have different shapes and sizes, also different colors. Now, values can also be assigned as weights to the edges, giving relative strengths to the relationships between the nodes. And edge thickness, color, and transparency as attributes can be used to characterize these relationships. Now, the ability to display many attributes at once is one of the biggest advantages of using network representations and turns them into powerful data exploration tools. Now we will step through the process that we follow to create a network representation of a data set. The first step is acquiring the data, right? Here, for example, we have mineral occurrence data, where each row represents a certain mineral found at a certain locality on the Earth's surface. So a mineral locality pair, if you will. As you can see in this first line, malachite, for example, is found at a location called Miramore District. Now, Remember, we're using mineral distribution data here, but as we showed in the previous examples, these methods are applicable to data from many different domains. Now, the second step would be to process this data to find which minerals coexist with which, which is the basis of the network, really. And you can do this in your favorite data science platform. We're using R and RStudio because it's free, accessible, and open source. So what we are doing is basically going through the data set and counting the co-occurrence of each pair of minerals in order to assemble what we call a mineral coexistence matrix that you see on the right. Now, the names on the, of the rows and columns, um, they represent distinct mineral species, and the values within the matrix itself represent the frequency of co-occurrence of each two minerals. Third step, we create the network structure. That's to say the links and the nodes. Now, the links is just, or the table on the left, is just another way of looking at this coexistence matrix. It lists the pairwise relationships and this value column you see applied or uh, mapped to each of the relationships, it really is just a normalized version of the frequency of co-occurrence. Now, the table on the right is a list of all the minerals taking part in the network, in addition to some known attributes of these minerals, things like redox state, color, luster, and hardness that are collected from literature sources and other databases. Now, once we have these two objects, the final step is to actually visually render the network and apply any annotation and filtering to the diagram. Rendering the diagram involves first selecting a layout configuration. Now, the layout can be a static layout for ease of readability, or it can be a dynamic layout, such as force-directed layouts that we commonly use. Now, force-directed layout methods, they simulate attractive and repulsive forces between the nodes to find the optimal configuration. In addition to the, lay the layout of the nodes, uh, the nodes and the links themselves can be colored, as we said previously, shaped and sized, to demonstrate different attributes. In this network of copper minerals, nodes are sized by frequency of occurrence. Link distances are constrained by the strength of the relationship, um, such that minerals that occur frequently together are closer to each other. The nodes are colored by chemistry, 
specifically in this case, the presence or absence of sulfur and oxygen. So sulfides in red and sulfates in yellow. You can see they separate pretty well within the network. Now, to render the diagram, this specific diagram, we use the library called D3, which renders the diagrams in a web browser, um, allows a high level of customization, but there are many packages and libraries that achieve the same purpose. Now, we mentioned earlier that being able to represent these relationships or the relationships among the data elements with many additional parameters is one of the highlights of network visualizations. So let's explore that idea a little more by looking at another one of our networks. So here we have a network of carbon minerals and their relationship to the localities at which they're found. Carbon minerals are represented by the colored nodes, colored on their age of first occurrence, with red being the oldest, moving into blue as the youngest. And their diameter corresponds to their frequency of occurrence, so larger nodes are more abundant. The black nodes represent carbon mineral localities on Earth's surface, and they're sized by their mineral diversity or the number of mineral species found at that locality. So why do we want to use networks instead of traditional XY types of plots that we're used to seeing? What's the benefit? Well, let's look at some of the traditional plots and graphs of this data set and compare it to the network rendering. Uh, first, we have a standard histogram showing the frequency distribution of mineral occurrence. It illustrates that most minerals are rare and only a few are very common. We can also see this trend in the network diagram. You'll notice that there are only a few very large nodes near the bottom of the network, and that there are many smaller, less common nodes as you move upward and around the edges of the network. Another chart is the familiar XY scatter plot, which we can graph in which we can graph uh, age against frequency of occurrence. Looking at the plot, it's apparent that the oldest minerals are the most abundant, and as time goes by, we can see that a decrease in abundance and an increase in mineral diversity. Well, we can see this trend in the XY plot is much clearer in the network. You can see that the larger, more common minerals here at the bottom in red are the oldest, transitioning into smaller, less common minerals as we move up into the blue. You'll also notice that diversity increases with decreasing age, that is to say, with time. The last type I'd like to show you is a traditional box plot. Here we can see that localities with high mineral diversity tend to contain uh, rare minerals or minerals that are found at only a few localities. And conversely, that localities with very few minerals tend to contain extremely common minerals like calcite or malachite. These box plots illustrate this relationship, but it's much more apparent when you look at the network. For example, if you look at the Kola Peninsula, you'll notice that it is connected to many mineral species and that these mineral nodes tend to be small, indicating that they're rare. And if we look at some of the localities that have low mineral diversity, represented by these small black nodes here at the bottom, you'll notice they are connected to a very few common mineral nodes. So I hope that we've established that networks are a superior visualization tool when compared to traditional graphing methods and that they give you the opportunity to visualize many dimensions of your data in one relatively easy to digest diagram. But network theory is more than just a visualization tool. So let's move on now and talk about some of the quantitative methods that can be applied to network data. Now these quantitative methods allow us to do descriptive and predictive analyses in order to quantify and characterize the trends and patterns in the data. Let's start by discussing a few network metrics. The first thing to mention is that there are two distinct types of metrics. The first is local, which gives us information about a single node in a network. The second is global, which tells us about the network as a whole. Local metrics can answer questions like how important is one particular node in the network and does one node communicate between two separate groups of nodes in a system? Global measures can tell us things like whether or not the network is highly interconnected or if there are distinct groups or clusters of nodes. Now let's look at a specific, a few specific local measures, um, degree, distance, and betweenness. Note that there are many, many more metrics that you can use with networks. We just wanted to show you a few quick examples. Firstly, degree. It's a very straightforward concept. It's just the number of links connecting to a particular node, as you can see in the diagram here. The degree of the node in the middle is five because there are five incoming or outgoing connections. Now the concept of distance in networks is defined as the geodesic or shortest path between two nodes. So for any one node, there's a whole distribution of distances really. We can look at the maximum, the minimum, the average, and so on. It gives you a sense of where the node lies relative to the rest of the network. 
Lastly, betweenness is a measure of the number of geodesic paths that pass through a given node. Essentially, it tells us how many shortest paths must pass through this node. Or is it a broker in the network, as you can imagine, a middleman that connects or communicates between distinct separate groups. So now let's move on to global measures, which are generally more important in our studies of mineralogical systems, um, but that may not be true for your data sets, or you could be more interested in local measures. Again, there are many metrics, but we're interested in, uh, or, but we're just going to mention a few, uh, specifically density, diameter, uh, degree centralization, and betweenness centralization. Density is a simple measure of the interconnectedness of a network. It is the number of links divided by the maximum number of possible links in the network. If we take a look at an example, you'll see that a highly interconnected network has a high value of density, like in the network on the right you see here. Uh, the next metric is diameter. We mentioned distance when we talked about local metrics, and it's related to a network's diameter. Diameter is the longest geodesic distance in the whole network. So essentially, it's the maximum degree of separation, a concept I think most of us are pretty familiar with. Uh, we can also look at the mean distance if we're interested in the average degree of separation in a network. Uh, lastly, I'd like to mention the centralization measures. Centralization is a measure of how central a network's most central node is relative to the rest of the network. It gives a sense of the uniformity of the network topology and its interconnectedness. The difference between degree and between the centralization is simply whether you're interested in how interconnected the nodes are or if you're interested in studying the degrees of separation and determining if there are a few key broker nodes. <clears throat> so here we have a table of metrics compiled for three mineral systems. Minerals found in igneous rocks, copper minerals, and chromium minerals. We can visually see that these networks are quite different, but their differences can be quantified uh, by the measures in this table. For instance, we can see that the igneous minerals have a very high density, indicating that it's a highly interconnected network, especially when compared to chromium minerals, which only have 5% of the possible connections in the network. We see that the largest diameter or degree of separation is much higher in chromium than in the others as a result of partitioning based on the formational environments of these minerals. There are also some differences in centralization worth mentioning, but let's move on to another analysis technique called clustering. Now, clustering is a suite of methods that we can apply to a network to partition it into subgraphs based on optimizing some metric. These types of analysis could provide insight into the nature of the nodes in the network. They may reveal patterns of the evolution of the network, especially if um, examined over a time interval. Um, they can also, or studying, but actually the relationships between the subgroups or the partitions found within the network can also give us insight. Now, the first method we're going to look at is called walk track. Um, this method finds subgroups by simulating random walks across the network. The idea is that short, random walks from a given node tend to stay within the same community. So if you start walking or hopping from one node with a set maximum number of steps, let's say five, and you do this for all nodes in the network over and over again, you end up with a separation of the nodes based on these walks. As you can see here with walk trap, we get a really nice separation of the um, network, and these partitions actually reflect, reflect the formational conditions of chromium minerals. Now, another method called Louvain clustering takes a hierarchical approach where it starts with each node in its own cluster, and then it iteratively uh, merges clusters together while computing a modularity score for the entire graph. Now, by optimizing that score, the algorithm arrives at the final assignment of clusters as you can see, we get a slightly different segregation here than we did with walk track. Now, the choice of which algorithm to use or which method to employ really depends on the type of data and the questions being asked. And again, these were just a sample of the methods, methods that can be applied to network data to extract useful information. There are many, many more, and you can always develop your own as your research requires. So thank you all for sticking with us, and we hope we've shown you that network visualizations and analyses are applicable to data from many different domains. Uh, network renderings could allow you to detect trends and patterns in your data that may not be readily apparent in your spreadsheets or XY plots. And in applying network analysis methods, you can characterize and quantify complex relationships in your multidimensional data.
Um, so in conclusion, no matter what your field of study, you can likely use these techniques to garner new insights and address new questions. And with that, I'd like to mention that we have posted a link to the Keck Deep Time Data Infrastructure website where you can access and interact with the networks we showed you today and a number of others. And uh, we also posted a few links to useful software and tools. Um, so now does anyone have any questions? Let's uh, look at the chat room and see if there are any questions that we should answer there. Well, we don't have any questions. Hi. Um, and so we can also take audio questions if someone wants to uh, come on and say something. Great. So the first question is regarding the libraries you use. So do you mean an R? Yeah, so let's, for example, separate between the processing of the data and then the rendering of the network. In terms of processing, as I said uh, um, in, um, during the, the presentation, we use R to just read in the data, to manipulate it, reshape it, to put it in the right form for the network. But you can easy, as easily use Python and do that in Jupyter, for example. So that's an, sort of an intermediate step. It's just getting the data in the right form. Now, for rendering the network, we've been mostly using D3. D3 is a, it's a web de development uh, library. It allows you to create renderings and, and visualizations of all types in a browser. It's meant for customizability and interactivity, so you can actually add buttons and, and things to change around the network and dynamically re-render it based on filters. And, and, and so um, we've posted the links. They should be up on the webinar page. Uh, but yeah, but there are many, many packages within R, like iGraph, for example, or Network D3, or, and, and a number of others that allow you to do both things, manipulate the data or create the network structure and render it, and also do analyses. Um, so yeah, please take a look at the links, and if you have further questions about the libraries that we're using, feel free to contact us. And the next question is, what was the original source of the mineral data? So uh, these data actually came from uh, many different places. Uh, some of you might be familiar with mindat.org, which is a crowdsourced uh, mineral locality database, which has hundreds of thousands of uh, data entries on uh, mineral locality pairs, like we mentioned earlier. Um, so that's a really powerful tool. Uh, we also went to literature resources uh, to find this information, so papers, books. Um, I did a pretty exhaustive search. Uh, also, the Rough Project database. Um, at uh, ruff.info um, contains a lot of really useful uh, mineralogical information. So we essentially went to every mineral source we possibly could. Uh, we've also got collaborations going on with other organizations like uh, the USGS, and we're incorporating their data into, into our studies. So pretty much anywhere you can think of to get mineral data. Okay, and so Bob Hazen wants to know if we can think of some good DCO applications to other communities. Um, sure, absolutely. Uh, we, uh, there are some paleobiology studies going on uh, in which we're looking at the relationships between fossils. Um, and I'm sure there are many other applications. If you... um, absolutely. How about cross-community applications of these methods? That would be great, looking at um, data sets that are just were collected separately and, and are used for, you know, separate research but are actually related somehow. That would be a great way to demonstrate the power of these methods. But I'm thinking also some, something else for DCO in terms of, you know, the publications that are created within this community. A lot of them, I would assume, um, cross boundaries, cr cross disciplinary boundaries. And so these could be studies, the relationships, you know, as we said, collaboration effort. The study between collaborators in the DCO could, um, first of all, teach us something about, you know, how the DCO is doing, but also could uh, serve as, as, you know, as actually proof that something interdisciplinary like this sort of um, organization actually, actually gets stuff done. And then uh, Darlene asks, do you think this is the future for presenting data and showing relationships among data points? Um, I certainly think it's part of the future. Uh, it, it's a great way to be able to look at 
many facets of your data at one time and to be able to see relationships that you would never see when you're just looking at a spreadsheet. You know, when you have thousands and thousands of rows and hundreds of, of columns, you're just not going to see it there. Um, so I think it's certainly the way we should be heading uh, with data visualization. And I also think uh, there are a lot of really powerful statistics that you can do uh, on the, your data sets uh, to get a lot of information about that. We didn't go too much into that today. Um, but there are a lot of techniques you can use, and I think that's really powerful. So anything where you're, you're looking at correlations amongst many different parameters is, is way more powerful than, uh, you know, an XY sort of study. And, and an interesting point there is that you don't throw away the, let's say, the, the previous structure that you have, this spreadsheet form. All the data within a spreadsheet is still, it's still embedded within the network. It's just that the network captures functional uh, relationships rather than just attributes or similarity of attributes. Great. So do we have any other questions, either in the chat or with audio? I think we are going to wrap it up. Um, so thank you so much, Shauna and Ahmed, and everyone who joined us for this DPA webinar Wednesday. If you would like more information about Shauna and Ahmed's work, feel free to get in touch with them directly, or you can contact the DCO engagement team. Um, all of our contact information is available on the DCO website, deepcarbon.net. Um, an archive of this webinar will be available soon on the website. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Katie Pratt. I'm uh, part of DCO's engagement team. And I'd love to hear from you if you have ideas for future webinar Wednesday series. In the meantime, I hope you'll join us at 2 p.m. on Wednesday, the 26th of July, for the next webinar Wednesday in this series, when Mark Giorso and Dmitry Svajensky will demonstrate how to use the Enabling Knowledge Integration, or ENKI, tools for modeling deep earth fluids, chemical reactions, and transport. Thanks again for joining us, and see you all in July. <laughs>